How much racism still exists in your opinion today? A lot exists today. You see, uh, when I say a lot, you see stuff all the time. Uh, and it's sad to me, it, you see it all the time. Because, it, it, and I always say, racism is the greatest cancer of my lifetime. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so that you always know when we have brand new content so you won't miss a thing. Random things you need to know, I am a Klansman. Yes, KKK Klansman. I'm a, I'm, I guess I'm a member for the episode. That's that's what's written on the script. I'll, uh, if you guys are at BitChute watching, thank you for coming. If you guys are at YouTube watching, thank you for coming back while we have the chance to bring you these episodes. And if you are at Rumble watching, well, thank you for coming back. I'm going to read three articles because apparently racism is everywhere. And I was unaware of how much racism was just around me. I needed these three people to tell me. The first article is from a person named Pat Saperstein. Off top, I already know who they are. And she would like for me to know how racist trees are. Yes, she actually starts it off with how can trees be racist? It's a question explored in a new documentary called Racist Trees. There's a documentary called Racist Trees. Palm Springs is the one resort in America which has everything. When most people think of Palm Springs, they're thinking of the restaurants and the hotels and the pool sides. And I'm thinking, wow, this looks really nice to me. And then you pass this wall of trees. You're in an entirely different world. As a kid growing up, they were just trees. But as we got older, we started to understand they were planted to hide this community because of the people who lived here. At the time, African-Americans were not allowed to live inside Palm Springs proper. A wealthy African-American man bought this tract of land and developed it as a place for black families. At the same time, a golf course was being developed. And it's unclear exactly why or when, but a row of trees went in. It actually takes about 10 feet to 15 feet of my yard. I feel like I'm not a part of Palm Springs with those trees up. Why is my property value not going up? Real estate has exploded in Palm Springs. If this had been a Caucasian community from the begin with, there would be no issue here. Nobody at City Hall is convinced at all that this is a racist issue or ever was a racist issue. The city council doesn't include anyone that looks like me. We're so progressive, we're so liberal, that accusing Palm Springs of being racist now is almost ridiculous to me because we just don't see it. Do they have any other negative impact? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Just quickly, how many want them out? Raise your hand. Bataru. Who wants them to stay for any reason? There's a reason that they're there. <laughs> the first article I published about the trees got a lot of reaction. Liberals have run out of racist statues to take down. What racist sentiments have they expressed to you? It is their intent. Now, now, we'll hold on. You can be a progressive town and still hold on to racist tradition. They've been staring at a wall. What's the difference between that wall and the Berlin Wall? They can prove that by one simple act, remove the trees. The Palm Springs City Council voting tonight. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Motion is on the floor. Oh my God, who the hell cares? The controversy over whether trees should be removed might have remained a small local issue if it wasn't for a 2017 article. In the local paper, The Desert Sun, reported by Corinne Kennedy, the piece drew worldwide attention to the idea of racist trees. It riled up Tarko Carlson and other right-leaning media outlets which fanned outrage over the idea that trees could be cut down as punishment. The article also piqued the interest of documentary directors Sarah Nevins and Mina T. Sun. We just immediately thought there was not only a visual metaphor going on here, but this hidden part of the city that we had no idea about and figured a lot of people outside or even inside of Palm Springs maybe didn't know either. But despite the Fox News outrage, it wasn't that the trees themselves were racist. As the documentary explains, the possibility that the trees could have been planted with the intent of segregating the neighborhood from the golf course raised issue of inequity in the community. The Crossley Tract in Eastern Palm Springs was built by Lawrence Crossley, an early black developer who wanted to provide higher quality dwellings for the city's black residents. 
who often could who often could only find substandard housing. The houses alongside a golf course and the smaller subdivision would usually be prime real estate, but at some point in the early 1960s, a row of shaggy tamarisk trees was built to divide the houses from the golf course. It's a question lots of lost in history whether the intent was to keep black residents out of sight from golfers or merely to catch stray golf balls, but over the years the trees grew huge and started hogging water and dropping massive amounts of needles creating a fire hazard and a playground for rats. Not only did the block not only did they block the green fairways of the gro- of the golf course, they grew so tall they blocked the view of the mountains behind one of the prime attractions of living in Palm Springs. The houses in the Crossley Tract were worth less than the homes in surrounding neighborhoods, and being cut off by the foliage felt like another slight for the families that had already been affected by the city of Palm Springs brutally clearing the homes of black and Latino residents in the Section 14 area downtown. The press conference being held here in Los Angeles to get national attention on this important local story from Palm Springs and the damage done to Section 14 survivors more than 50 years ago. My father worked hard and built our home and we had to leave it behind. My childhood innocence, fun and happy going life was taken from me. Delia Taylor was born and raised on Section 14. She's one of hundreds of black and Mexican families who were forced out of the prime downtown property by the city of Palm Springs in the 1950s and 60s and now want economic justice returned. The plan was to bulldoze and to burn their homes in many cases with their personal belongings still inside. Ariva Martin is the lead attorney for Section 14 survivors and descendants. She and dozens affected gathered in Los Angeles Tuesday to announce the new amended claim against the city of Palm Springs seeking restitution. Justice for who? Section 14. Justice for who? Section 14. The city of Palm Springs issued a formal apology in September 2021. We cannot erase our role in what happened. But the survivors say that alone is not enough. Economist Dr. Julian Malvo has calculated the economic harm done to these families based on the present values of the homes and property that were lost. She says it's an estimated 400 million to $2 billion. That's not the number that we're necessarily asking for. That's a number we come to the table with, and we're asking for Palm Springs to deal with us in good faith. Palm Springs Council Member and State Assembly candidate Christy Holstage admits it would be hard to properly compensate survivors. The city of Palm Springs has a $220 million annual budget. I think lifting this up to the statewide level and discussing ways that the state might be able to help fund this effort would be helpful. A simple row of trees might sound like a niche subject, but it gave the filmmakers plenty to unpack. Not only was Palm Springs a city known for liberal values and inclusiveness, but the person who spearheaded the campaign was a real was a white real estate agent who had recently moved into the historically black community. That also raised the question of who should best tell the story, which was becoming the crucial consideration for the documentary filmmaking in recent years. The residents of Crossley Tract had some initial hesitation that the directors were not black. That's not racist. While Racist Trees focuses on interviews with residents of Crossley Tract and local officials, it also puts the subject into a broader context, looking at how walls, trees, freeways, and other dividers have historically kept people economically and culturally segregated around the world. Okay. So this, this story is about how a golf course was built and they made, they put some artificial trees up and apparently this is racist. Everybody who is calling it racist happens to be Caucasian and women. All right, so the next story that we have is the unintentional racism found in traffic signals. You didn't know? Check this out. (sighs) The unintentional racism found in traffic signals. What? Traffic signals? 
Yeah. Yeah. Washington, D.C.'s pro football team, Aunt Jemima Pancake Products, Eskimo Pies, they're all examples of everyday racism that bombards people of color from the supermarket to the playing field. They're also all iconic American products that both corporations and consumers finally agree are ready for a rebrand. This story is by David Kaufman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we already know who he is too. These instances may be far subtler than a mascot or an offensive term, but no less pervasive and no less deserving of cultural reckoning. For me, the reckoning begins with traffic signals. A few months back before COVID-19 kept us in our homes and George Floyd made us take to the streets, as I was walking with a friend, her daughter, and my twin sons, my friend is white, I am not. Remember, honey, she said to her daughter as we waited for the light to turn green, we need to wait for the little white man to appear before we can cross the street. My boys are a few younger than her daughter, and we hadn't yet tackled the crossing the street component of basic toddler training. As a black dad, I was struck by the language at play. How is it possible that well into the 21st century, parents all over Manhattan, well-meaning, hashtag BLM marching parents, are teaching their children to ask little white men for permission to cross the street? And why doesn't this seem to bother them? It certainly bothered me. So much so that I began to dig deep into my 40-something consciousness to try and remember if I was raised, if, if I was raised asking a little white guy to let me cross the street, were these the words my progressive white mother used to teach her little brown children the fundamentals of pedestrian safety? Turns out I wasn't raised this way and neither most likely were you. Back when most of us were kids, stoplights and traffic signals across the U.S. typically relied on words rather than images to let folks know when to walk or wait to stop or cross. At the time, walk and don't walk typified traffic signage, but began to be phased out because words could be mis misunderstood by increasingly globalized populations. For the next four decades or so, our little friend slowly and formally replaced its outdated predecessors until 2009. That's when the walking person finally became the FHWA standard. And as the spokesperson says, the option to use words is no longer permitted in newly installed signals. One day soon, every traffic signal will contain a walking person along with its counterpart, a bright red hand telling folks not to walk. Okay, so I don't really understand why this article even has any more paragraphs. Apparently, David Kaufman, the homosexual black slash Jewish writer, has clearly defined that what he was saying is not racist. It's not racist. There's no little white men telling you to cross the street. I'm assuming he doesn't go use the bathroom because there's all kind of little white men, gray men telling him what to do on those. Oh, perish the thought that you may have to go take a shit or a pee. Someone complained that the men's room is whites only. Stanley, you know that's not true. I didn't say that. And why is there a picture of a white man on the door? Good thing there are gender neutral bathrooms, so now you can have a white man or a white woman tell you what to do. And I'm sure seeing is how Mr. Coffin appears to be a little bitch boy. I'm sure he likes to use the women's bathroom or the gender neutral ones. Anyway, moving on. Well, the USC has a problem with the word field. Apparently it's racist. Check this out. Field would seem a perfectly fine word. It means an open area or particular focus of study. It comes from Old English via West Germanic. But it says right here, it's totally racist. We're going to run out of vocabulary soon. According to the School of Social Work at USC, the word has anti-black and anti-immigrant connotations because it could be used in phrases like going into the field or field hand as if students at the school are fresh off being coerced to work in some hot field or for that matter, as if whites were never enslaved or made into serfs. USC should read up on the Vikings who enslaved a lot of people who are just as white as they were. Besides, who can really object to phrases like field of daisies or field of dreams or taking the field? I guess the USC baseball team should be very grateful that it's still allowed to have fielders 
at least for now. The School of Social Work is replacing the word with practicum, which really rolls off the tongue, just like Latinx or undocumented foreign national. If this seems completely insane, unfortunately, it's par for the course and not just something out of left field. Well, there you have it. Three examples of racism presented to you by homosexuals and progressive white people. This is fantastic information because it just lets me know that we are going in the right direction. And obviously, white people, progressive whites and gay people think that black people are so weak and so inept that words like field bother us and that we would be offended by trees blocking us possibly from seeing a golf course. I don't know if that's what they really did that for or not. Or from them seeing us. I don't know. Maybe the golfers didn't want to see black people. I, I don't know. But of course, white people think that we're offended by that. And they also think that we're offended by... Um, the idea of traffic signals having little white people on them. Wow, man. The ideas that progressive whites and homosexuals have about black people is amazing. They really think that we are little fragile idiots. And everything offends us. And this may come from the fact that most African Americans do not fight back when the NAACP or when Black Lives Matter or well, when black feminist groups come out and say that these things do offend us, we don't step back and say, hey, 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 hold on. That offends you as an individual, not us as an entire race. We allow that rhetoric to go on and then we look for the goodies to come out of it. What are you going to give us for that so-called racism? And then when we get stuff, well, then that becomes the standard. That's probably why we have this kind of nonsense happening right here. And if all of this is going to offend us, then why, why, why stop there? Cotton offends us. No more cotton clothing should ever be worn or even promoted by African-Americans. No one should even sell cotton clothing to blacks because it's offensive because of the picking of it. I'm assuming that peanuts would also be offensive because of the blacks who, who had to pick peanuts on the peanut fields in, in South Carolina. I would be sure that boats, ships are offensive. Chains and whips. I don't understand it, but I can't blame you. If it wasn't for us allowing this to be, allowing you all to be the spokespeople for our race, no one would ever think this about our race. And like we can't survive out here without calling everything racist. I'll see you guys in the next one. Tell me what you think in the comment section. Do you think, no, Lorenzo, these things are racist. All of them. They're all racist. And there's more things that are racist. More. There's more. You just haven't touched on it yet, but you should. Okay, well, let me know in the comment section. Maybe I will read that and touch on it at some other time. Do you feel like me? This is making black people look like we are weak. Like everything offends us. But are we responsible for this? I mean, don't we act like everything offends us? So if we're going to get offended by all these things, then I guess white people are doing what they're supposed to do. They're, they're saving us. They're being our knights. They're, they're trying to create cultural change. And I guess, you know, we've been complaining about stuff, so maybe here we are. This is, this is the change that needed to happen from the whites and the gays. And as you see, this is happening. All right, I'll see you guys in the next one. This is something that you needed to know because apparently racism is everywhere and it's affecting us all the time. No, I, I don't know how we are able to exist. I don't know how we've lasted so long since 1865 without slavery. I don't know how we lasted. We, we seemed safer on the plantation. Now everything is offensive. My, 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 how will we make it another 100 years? All right, I'll see you guys in the next one. Random Radio. Yeah, boy!